Welcome back to Space This Week. We had a huge amount of testing and progress with SpaceX's Starship, a rather hair-raising Falcon 9 launch and landing, India conducted its second attempt at a lunar landing mission, the James Webb Space Telescope celebrated its first year of operations, and China made history with the launch of the Chu Che 2. All of this and more in store, let's dive in. For the past few weeks, one of the main focal points of Starship and Starbase coverage has been the repair works to the orbital launch mount base and the installation of the pipework and water-cooled steel plating and deluge jets, call it either the upside-down showerhead or the booster bidet, whatever floats your boat, <laughs> and it looks like SpaceX have started up some pretty significant tests of what they've built so far. Last Wednesday, the whole area was cleared ahead of some sort of test and then, as evening drew in, we saw this. What you're looking at is a high-pressure gas being blasted through the new water cooling system. This might have been a test of the structure and pipeworks, but alternatively, this could have just been to purge the new pipework of all the dust and debris that accumulated during construction. Look at how much dust was thrown into the air. In reality, it was probably a bit of both. The high-pressure gas will be used to force the water through the system at high speed. I can't wait to see this tested. When we'll see this happen isn't known yet, but it's probably not too far away. All the water-cooled steel plates have been installed now, and it looks like all the major pipes have been laid, though of course, there's probably still a bit of welding that needs to happen. This wasn't the only high-pressure gas test that we saw at the launch site last week. Under the cover of darkness on Friday, we saw a Raptor quick disconnect test on the orbital launch ring. The outer 20 Raptor engines of Super Heavy can't start themselves, as the ship doesn't have enough onboard gas to spin up all 33 engines, just the inner ones. This is because the outer engines only need to ignite the once, while the rocket is still on the pad, so it makes sense to store this gas externally and feed the engines from the ground systems, thereby saving mass and increasing payloads to orbit. Here's a similar test being performed before the Booster 7 and Ship 24 launch, recorded by SpaceX to give you a better sense of how this looks. The final test we saw conducted at the launch site last week was a test of the Booster Quick Disconnect system, which is the first time we've seen this tested following the installation of its new pipes and hoses. In addition to testing the new, SpaceX continues repairing the old, with workers seen preparing the draw work system, the thing that moves the chopsticks up and down, the new shielding, and concrete pouring around the pad continued throughout the week. NASA spaceflight photographer Jack Bayer captured this footage of the Starlink box outside the Starlink storage building. This device is used for loading Starlink V2 satellites into the Starship payload bays, first seen in action back in June last year with Ship 24, as captured here by Starship Gazer. Obviously, we know that Ship 24, and now Ship 25, had their payload bay doors removed, leaving this thing without a purpose, but the recent upgrades to Ship 28's payload bay door, with its new reinforced structure, shows us that we might be closer to seeing payload carrying ships soon, which means that this thing is back in business. I doubt it's going to be used for Ship 28 first, though. It's much more likely to see its first action with Ship 24.2. Now, this is a new test article, captured here by NASA Spaceflight, standing at seven rings tall, and is essentially just a Starship payload bay capped at either end with a forward and aft ring. This animation from Chameleon Circuit and the Ring Watchers does a great job showing the anatomy of this vehicle. It looks like the top ring is what we previously thought might have been the vent ring designed for the booster, for hot staging, but it looks like these holes are actually just part of the test interface for this vehicle. It'll be a while before we see Starship payload missions. Ship 25 and Ship 26, both vehicles with engines installed and no evidence of retirement, will fly first, so at minimum there will be two flights before we see any payload. Unless, of course, SpaceX just skips over these vehicles, it wouldn't be the first time we saw a flight-ready vehicle having undergone major testing, suddenly retired. Ship 20 and Booster 4 were all set to be the first integrated flight test of Starship before they were both stood down, although this was due to the fact that they used the outdated Raptor 1 engines and likely a slew of other outdated systems, which is a real testament to just how quickly SpaceX are developing the Starship. As for the buildings at Starbase, the new Star Factory building continues to rise at rapid pace, and the new high bay is starting to really stretch towards its final height, and Lab Padre captured the arrival of some new stair risers for the structure arriving at the site last week. As for what's inside these buildings, we saw the arrival of the first of Booster 12's grid fins for installation at the top of the stack. 
It's been a little while since we took a look at Starbase in Florida, but last week our eyes in the skies Greg Scott and Fariel were in the air to take a look. It looks like progress at this site isn't as active as what we're seeing at Boca Chica. That mystery third tower is still only at seven units, sat separately at the Starbase site. The high bay site is now very barren, as most of the metal work for the building was seemingly shipped off to Boca Chica to build the new high bay there instead. However, we do have these three tower segments, which weren't here during the last flyover. As you can see, these are significantly smaller than the Starship launch tower sections, so probably aren't part of the Starship launch pad infrastructure. Instead, it's much more likely that these are for the crew access tower, set to be constructed at Launch Complex 40, a theory that makes sense given that the foundation work at Launch Complex 40 has already been poured. Blue Origin have been making some significant advances in constructing their answer to Starbase. This overview image paints a great picture of just how expansive the site is becoming. No sign of New Glenn yet at the launch pad, but look, another view of Project Jarvis. This will be a reusable upper stage for New Glenn, basically Blue Origin's version of Starship, and this looks like an early prototype complete with a spherical header tank. Greg also captured some photos of NASA's vehicle assembly building and their Artemis launch tower. Now speaking of Artemis, on Tuesday last week, Canoe Technologies delivered three specially designed crew transportation vehicles to the Kennedy Space Center. These environmentally friendly vehicles are fully electric and zero emission, and they will play a crucial role in transporting astronauts from the crew quarters at Kennedy to Launch Pad 39B, where their rockets and spacecraft await them. Going back to Launch Complex 40, as you can see in this photo, Greg managed to capture a Falcon 9 preparing to launch. This launch took place the day after this photo was taken, on Sunday the 16th of July. This was Mission Starlink Group 5-15, which saw the Falcon carry 54 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The first stage then performed its descent, and to be honest, for a heart-stopping moment, I thought it might have ended in disaster, as it looked like the booster wasn't directly over the ship, and then the livestream froze, something that seldom happens following SpaceX's use of Starlink to stream these launches. Happily, it turned out that all was well, and that the booster had indeed successfully landed on the assured fall of Gravitar's drone ship. It wouldn't have been outlandish to worry about the booster landing, this is an older one after all. In fact, this was its 16th mission in total, having previously supported Transporter 2 and 6, GPS 303, Turksat 5A, Intelsat G33 and 34, and 10 Starlink missions. SpaceX obviously plans to eventually replace Falcon 9 with Starship, which will use Methalox to power it to space, a fuel that no other rocket has ever managed to successfully reach orbit with, despite there being a few attempts here and there. That is, until last week, when China managed to pull it off with the launch of the Chu Che 2 on Wednesday, a rocket built by private space launch provider Land Space, based in Beijing. The first launch of this vehicle, the Chu Che 1, was made in December last year, but this sadly failed to reach orbit. This new vehicle, though, which carried no payload, was successful, netting land space the landmark achievement of first ever Methalox rocket to reach orbit. Despite the monumental achievement of this launch, it probably wasn't the most exciting mission that took place last week. That award probably goes to the Chandrayaan-3 mission, an Indian robotic moon lander mission that took to the skies last Friday following the Chandrayaan-2, which sadly ended in failure after the lander crashed into the moon's surface. This mission involves three vehicles, a lunar orbiting satellite, as well as a lunar lander that contains a small stowed rover. The lander and rover are expected to land near the lunar South Pole region on the 23rd of August this year. The James Webb Space Telescope's first year of science operations was celebrated on the 12th of July with the release of an impressive image showcasing the Rho Ophiuchi Cloud Complex, located approximately 390 light years away. The Webb Telescope's capabilities have led to remarkable discoveries, including the observation of some of the earliest galaxies, detailed views of exoplanet atmospheres, and captivating images of planets within our own solar system. Here's to another great year of James Webb operations. Aboard the International Space Station, NASA astronaut Steve Bowen conducted the Zero T2 experiment on Thursday. This experiment aims to understand the impact of bone, muscle, and overall aerobic health when crew members do not use a treadmill for exercise during their space flights. The results obtained from this investigation will provide valuable insights into whether alternative exercise regimes can effectively maintain physical health on future missions. Currently, the crew on the International Space Station dedicates approximately two hours per day to exercise using specialized space workout equipment, such as a stationary bike, weightlifting machine, and treadmill. 
Kerbal Space Program 2 received a pretty major hotfix last week. The infamous Sphere of Influence change trajectory bug was finally fixed, meaning that your trajectory should no longer suddenly change when leaving a planet or moon's Sphere of Influence. I put this to the test in a bold mission to Duna last week. In fact, that video may well be on your screen right now, in addition to another video from me which YouTube thinks you'll like. If you want to help support these videos like the people on the left did, then consider joining my Patreon or YouTube channel member program. It is always a massive, massive help and I'm hugely appreciative of your support. And of course, thank you all so much for watching today's video, and I'll see you in the next one.